Well, as you take your seat, could I invite you to reach for a Bible or turn to your Bible or your device to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 11. If you're using the church Bible, it's on page 679. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and we're we're finishing uh, this morning. And uh, the words will hopefully be on the screen as well. Yes, great. So um, we're reading, first of all, Ecclesiastes 11. And verse 7, light is sweet, and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years anyone may live, let them enjoy them all. But let them remember the days of darkness, for there will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. You who are young, be happy while you're young. And let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. So then banish anxiety from your heart. Cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigor are meaningless. And then chapter 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come, And the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain and the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop and the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the window grow dim and the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades. When people rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. When people are afraid of heights and of danger in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire is no longer stirred, then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Now all has been heard. And here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Amen. We know this to be true. Let me pray. Lord, bless your reading, uh, the reading of your word to your people. Uh, By your spirit, would you preach it to our hearts now? Would you make Christ clear to us and lovely to us? Uh, And do not let your word return void, but accomplish its purpose among us, we pray. Amen. So we've arrived finally at the last sermon of our series on Ecclesiastes. And I must say, it has been quite a journey. Uh, if you've been with us for every one of them, it kind of feels like we deserve some kind of a reward uh, for making it to the end. We've had some work to put in. Uh, we've really had to engage with the, the text. And, and we've come face to face with with some pretty stark thoughts. And, and, and I said at the very beginning of this sermon series, if you remember, that, that, that the author, most likely King Solomon, was not about to give us Sunday school answers to life's questions. He wasn't interested in giving us religious platitudes or or sentimental cliches, but he he, he was a man who felt a gnawing emptiness in in his soul that nothing within his grasp could satisfy. And and so we've seen him comment how uh, he sees um, bad things happen to good people, uh, evil people enjoying life, poor being exploited, politicians and, and leaders corrupt the guilty escaping justice and he just couldn't ignore it anymore Uh, and so he pushed us and pushed us into the discomfort of this text to the point where we might have feared he's right he almost took us there um, and he said to us with life being so transient with life being so difficult with life being so 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 painful so unjust with life being accompanied with this 
restlessness that nothing seems to be able to satisfy, he repeatedly asked us the question, is there any point? Is there any meaning? Is there any substance to this life? Or, or, is, it, or is it meaningless? Is it vanity of vanities? Is it a vapor or a cloud or a bubble that's here for just a brief moment and then disappears without a trace? And we've traveled that journey together together over the past three months. And so it's just a quick reminder, if you've missed any of those sermons and you want to catch up, you can watch them on our YouTube channel or on our Spotify podcast. But we, we've come to the last installment, the last sermon, and we're landing on chapter 12. The, 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 this is what we read. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, And the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Now, now we we started way back in September. It's hard to believe that in September the evenings were still light and there was a bit of heat around. The summer holidays had just ended. And we finished this morning in the darkness of December. And between then and now, we've experienced the days getting darker and darker as we head towards the winter solstice. And the author, as he lands this book, he he describes poetically this process of aging that we all encounter as the sun setting on a life and things beginning to grow dim. If you have the text in front of you, look at chapter 11 and verse 7 where he speaks about the brightness or the light of youth. Light is sweet. It pleases the eye to see the sun. You who are young, be happy while you're young. Let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. And it does not sound like something an old person would say. Doesn't it? Youth is wasted on the young Like a honeymoon is a holiday wasted on a couple with no children. You'll never appreciate it. You don't appreciate youth until it's gone. And the author says, in the light of your youth, would you be happy about it, please? Would you enjoy it? For anyone under, let's say 35 this morning, if you're watching online and you're under 35, would you just take 30 seconds to appreciate the fact that your knees are not sore. (laughs) Okay, because there's a room full of people that miss those days when their knees were not sore. Or or just even just appreciate your ability to remember people's names quickly. Or or, or making it through the night without needing to get up and pee. (laughs) Appreciate that, please, because, because you're taking that for granted. Would you please appreciate that? Because the author says that the sun is slowly setting on our lives. You know, pretty soon we're going to wonder where the hair on my head went and where the hair in my ears is coming from. And we're going to get excited about air fryers. And we're going to have a favorite ring in the hob. Right? Those days are coming. And, and, and that, that sounds like advice from an old person, doesn't it? You who are young, would you be happy while you're young? Would you let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth? And then he says this, very interesting, would you banish anxiety? Would you cast off troubles from your body? Because soon you're going to be old and you're going to wonder why you worried so much about so many things that mattered so little. You might remember a song released in the 90s called Everybody's Free to Wear Sunscreen. It was uh, essentially a speech given to students uh, at their graduation. This is the first verse. Enjoy the power and beauty of your youth. Oh, never mind. You'll not understand the power and beauty of your youth until they're faded. But trust me, in 20 years, you'll look back at photographs of yourself and you will recall in a way that you can't grasp now how much possibility lay before you and how fabulous you really looked 
you're not as fat as you imagine. Now, wouldn't you love another crack at your younger days? Wouldn't you? With, with all this perspective of, of wisdom and experience, Mark Twain said that by age 50, everybody has the face they deserve. Um, wouldn't we love to go back to our 20-year-old selves and say, for goodness sake, would you earn us a nicer face? <laughs> you know, would you ever think of doing a few stretches? Uh, to help your 50 year old body out would you eat a bit better maybe drink a bit less brush your teeth and if you have time moisturize your 50 year old will thank you for it but wouldn't you most want to say to your 20 year old self would you banish the anxiety from your heart <coughs> would you cast off the, the the troubles from your body lyra mckee the the, the journalist who uh, was killed by the new IRA when she reported on a riot. She wrote a letter to her 14-year-old self still in school. And it starts, kid, it's going to be okay. It finishes, it won't always be like this. It's going to get better. Now our best wisdom is always gained through hindsight, but would the younger people please take the older people's word for it today Banish anxiety from your heart and cast off troubles. Look at verse 9 with me. The author says, Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Now, I just want to say here that um, one of the most popular mantras in modern society is follow your heart. But I want to say this morning that's an incredibly dangerous half-truth. Because if we're to follow our heart without boundaries, well, that has ended more marriages. That has caused more addictions. That has mutilated more bodies, destroyed more souls. That has ended more lives than our enemy, the devil, could have ever hoped for. Follow your heart has wreaked havoc on relationships and families and caused many people great distress. Follow your heart is one of hell's most effective slogans. The Bible says the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. Which is why the author adds a perimeter or, or, or a boundary. Follow the ways of your heart in your youth, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. So, so know that God would have you squeeze every last ounce of joy out of life. In, in your youth, live so voraciously in, in, in the way that only youth can enable you to do. But remember your creator in your youth. There is a God. We're not under the sun. There's not just the consequences of your body or the consequences of relationships to think about. There is a God to obey. And there's a judgment to come. Now, young people don't listen to old people. You know the saying, whenever I was 18, my dad knew nothing. Whenever I was 21, my dad had learned a few things. But think about it. How much anxiety could we have banished from our youth by obeying God in our lives? How much trouble could we have cast off by remembering our Creator in, 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 our, in our youth. Here's the message for young people. Enjoy life as much as possible. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Before, verse 2, chapter 12 says, before the sun and light grow dark. Before the sun begins to set on your life and the days grow dark. Have a look with me at verses 3 to verses 7. I wonder, did it make any sense to you as, as I read it out? But the author is poetically describing the decline that comes with age. Have a look at these verses with me. There's a time coming when you'll learn what it means to be vulnerable and afraid in your own home. When your strength to do everyday things leaves you and you're reliant on other people. When you're limited to what you can eat because you've few or no teeth. 
your eyesight goes, your, 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 your hearing goes. You wake up early in the morning and you can't get back to sleep. Climbing a ladder to the roof space becomes too high and too dangerous. The streets become too busy, too scary, and people unfriendly. Driving at night becomes terrifying. You begin to lose interest in things. You watch your friends die. Your memory goes. And eventually, you return to dust. The poet Robert Frost wrote that the afternoon knows what morning never suspected. And when we're young, we can't even begin to imagine that happening to us because we consider ourselves a member of the invincible. But for those of us this morning in the autumn or even the winter of our lives, we might look back and say, oh, how old age has snuck up on me. And we want to shout to the youth, Embrace the joy of life. Enjoy it. Now, consider this morning you are as old as you've ever been and you are as young as you ever will be. Okay, so we are now, well, we will be an hour older than when we come in. So in one way, today is the youth of your older self regardless of what age we are. So this message isn't necessarily for 20-year-olds, but for all of us, however old our youth might be. And, and, and the author says, the best time to remember God is now, when we're as young as we'll ever be. Let me put it this way. If someone gifts you a large sum of money, let's say it's a life-changing sum of money, a couple of million pounds, if someone's going to gift you that, would you rather have that when you're 30? Or would you rather they wait until you're 90? Right? So we, we, we'd want that when we're 30, wouldn't we? When our, when our, our knees still work and we can enjoy it and, and, and enjoy the, the blessings it brings. Or, or, or at best, we might want that gift as soon as possible. We wouldn't want to wait for it. And the same thing with fearing God, worshipping God. You don't want to wait until you're older before you begin to do this. You want to fill your life with it as soon as possible. I heard a, 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 someone was, was telling me about whenever they were young, they were in Sunday school, and the Sunday school teacher was asking everybody, do you want to become a Christian? Do you want to become a Christian? And she said, yes. And then the teacher said, well, Christians don't go to the cinema. And Cliff Richard was playing in the Alpha. So she said, well, I'll become a Christian next week. <laughs> you know, please don't put off coming to Christ. Please don't waste any more time coming to Christ. Don't think that giving your youth to Christ is a waste of those days. Regardless of how much sand is left at the top of the hourglass, waste no more time giving yourself to God. Remember the creators in the day of your youth. Uh, and uh, it's a blessing that the author wants us to grasp. Okay, so the sun is poetically setting on a life. And the book of Ecclesiastes then sets poetically to this conclusion. Verse 13. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. Now, if we wanted an explanation of what it meant or what it looks like to remember God, this is probably as good as it gets. And when we talk about remembering God, we're not talking about uh, like remembering like, like we remember our, our PIN number. Okay, uh, last week I, I, I locked our credit card out because I couldn't remember my PIN and I put the wrong PIN in too many times and it locked out. And then Louise had to phone and get it unlocked, but she couldn't remember any of the security questions that we'd set. Uh, and so it was an ordeal. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, memory recall. We're not talking about mental recall. But to remember God is to place him at the forefront of your mind in a way that affects how you live. It's a remembrance in the heart 
more than the mind. And it's more akin to our, our call to worship from Psalm 34. We extol him, we praise him, we glorify him, we exalt him, we fear him. And to fear God is not to be afraid of him, but to fear God is to revere him, to respect him, to be in awe of him, to worship him. And a remembrance of God changes how we live because we obey him. It's a strange combination to come and worship God on a Sunday and then live in disobedience to him the rest of the week. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So fear God, keep his commandments, remember your creator, keep him at the forefront of your life. And that, says the author of Ecclesiastes, that is where we'll find meaning in life. That's where we'll find purpose or, or, or the duty, as he says here. And so here's what we've learned. It's not wealth. It's not pleasure, it's not relationships, it's not legacy, it's not wisdom, it's not fame, it's not success, it's not strength, it's not justice, it's not power, it's not self-mastery, it's not superiority, it's not comfort, it's not anything under the sun that might present itself as the thing that makes us happy, the meat of life, the author says, the purpose that we set ourselves upon for as long as we live is remember God. In all aspects of life, in everything that we experience, remember, honor, obey God, for such is the meaning of life. Everything else, he says, is mist, vapor, gone in a second. So we're going to come to the Lord's table now. And we're going to engage in the very act of remembering. In this sacrament of communion, we're going to bring the crucified Jesus to the forefront of our mind. We're going to bring his body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed for us and we're going to bring those to a place in our hearts so prominent that it's going to change how we live and commit us to obedience and as we do this in remembrance of him we're going to exercise the very meaning of our lives together let me pray father by your spirit as we approach your table, would you help us to remember you? And whether we're in our youth, our middle age or old age, would you let us recommit and rededicate ourselves to fear you and obey you? For you are the meaning of life. In Jesus' name, amen.